Dank je wel. <applaus> 35 miljoen raketjes. Is niet niks hoor. Uh, en het is het simpelste ijsje. Ik uh, heb al die, al die magnums en zo, is allemaal niks voor mij. Als ik een ijsje koop, doe niet zo vaak, maar dan koop ik dat raketje. Dat vind ik het lekkerste. Uh, Zita Kop, onze laatste spreekster voor de theepauze. Ze is geboren en getogen op een klein eiland bij Newfoundland in Canada, Fogo. Uh, daar woonden maar een paar duizend mensen. Ze is daar als kind opgegroeid, heeft het eiland verlaten, is naar college gegaan, university. Heeft een waanzinnige carrière gemaakt. En kon in 2002 kon ze verzilveren eigenlijk wat ze er allemaal in had gedaan. Nou, wat kan je dan doen? Dan kan je niks gaan doen natuurlijk, een hele tijd of lang, dat weet ik niet. Maar je kan ook iets leuks en iets moois gaan doen. Uh, nou, je kan ook nog vijf huizen kopen en zes boten en een vliegtuig en weet ik wat. Nee, wat zij deed was dat eiland waar ze vandaan kwam, daar ging ze naar terug. Daar woonden toen nog 2600 mensen. En ze zei, ik ga dat eiland een nieuwe kans geven. Dat ga ik weer op de kaart zetten. En dan niet met fancy dingen, maar met kunst, met art. Ziet er kop. Hello, thank you, Peter. So, let's uh, go to Fogo Island. So my old boss used to say, the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. <laughs> and so for Fogo Islanders, there's no, there's no doubt that place is the most important thing. And this is our place. Um, we are at 49 degrees latitude, which is actually three degrees south of here, so it's a moderate climate. We um, as Peter said, are about 2,500 people now, although we were more. I'm from the little town called Jobat's Arm. We are absolutely a fishing people. And we are very much formed by the sea. And you can see where we're located at, as an island, off an island, off the island of Newfoundland, at the very outer edge of the North American continent. And so, I am from this place, and I'm from these people. In fact, the tallest woman there is my mother. And they're washing fish. We were people of the salt fish trade. Electricity actually came to our island in 1971. And so for a very long time, we lived in relative isolation until, let's say, the 50s, when huge factory trawlers came to within five miles of our coast. And my father, my family had been on this island since 1650, and my father in his time of fishing saw the cod brought to the brink of extinction. And I remember his fish catch got smaller and smaller until one day he came home with exactly one fish, which he threw onto the kitchen floor and it sounded a bit like the end to us. And so he encouraged us to go away to school because he had lost hope for the fishery. But I have to take you now to Fogo Island. It is an immensely powerful, elemental place. And we are formed by this place. And even today, you, if you go there, you will find a people that are really tangled up with the natural world and very tangled up with each other. And it's a place where to be human just feels bigger. And we, we say we have at least seven seasons that we can identify and nature presses up against you all the time. And that is actually a very exhilarating feeling. And there's all manner of life on the island that we live with. And this is about as far as you can get from an administered life, because we can't tell these icebergs where to go. They come down with the Labrador current, and they go where the current says they're going to go. And so we are still a people of the sea. And that has never been an easy go, not from the beginning. But now it seems like it's more uncertain than ever. We have seen examples of other outport communities that have lost the fish and lost the boats. And worse than that, have had franchises move in to the point that I think they no longer recognize their place. And if you don't recognize your place, you soon can't recognize yourself. But because we're an island, we have a bit of isolation still. We're luckier than most because we still have a fishery. And so when we started the foundation, 
five years ago to figure out what to do, we realized that isolation, of course, is no longer an option. And so it's coming to us. And the question really is, can we find a way to make a truce with it, the outside world, in a way that we have some amount of input or determination to the outcome? And so when we thought about this, we partnered, by the way, with, with both levels of government, and we settled on a three-part approach, which was to lead with the arts and art, and to be art-centric in everything we did, because that's a way of knowing that is highly complementary to our way of knowing, which comes from the natural world. We have a social entrepreneurship model that we use in everything we do, and we obviously need to build another leg on the economy, which we're trying to do with geotourism, and for that, uh, we're building an inn. And this is the inn that we are in the middle of building. It's called the Fogo Island Inn. And this inn has a huge job, because it has to tell the story of us and the story of our lived experience in this place. And it's too much to get into all of that, so I'm going to focus on one little object in the inn, and that's the chair, and this particular chair. I really like this photograph of the chair, especially with the little price tag, because in a way it underscores kind of the fundamental challenges in our project, and it really brings attention to this whole important question of how we all value things. I have a little story about that from when I was growing up. When I was about 10, there was this junk collector that came to the island, a so-called antiques dealer from the mainland, looking for things that he could buy cheap and sell for more on the mainland. And of course, it was a wonderful thing to come to the outports because everybody made everything by hand. And so when he got to our house and peeked around the corner and saw the kitchen table, well, that was it. You know, his eyes lit up and this he had to have. And so I have to tell you, my parents couldn't have been more different. My mother yearned for the new. And my father took the comfort in what was before. And so, as Malcolm said this morning, she had a, he had a, she had a bias forward and he had a bias backward. But on that day, she won, and the junk collector gave us $5 for the wooden table. And I remember seeing it going away on the back of the truck, and knowing that that somehow was an important moment. We were sort of heroes in the community, because we were essentially a cashless society, so now we had $5. This was very quickly turned by my mother into a chrome set that came from the mainland, and we, everybody came to see it in the community. And it was all very exciting until about a year later, the leg fell off. And so my mother complaining to my father, wow, you're going to fix the table. He's like, I can't fix the table. You can't put a nail in it. It's plastic. And so we realize that the little temporary bit of economic power we felt with our $5 didn't take very long to translate to a complete loss of personal power and a loss of self-sufficiency. Unlike my uncle, who lived next door, who was the world's worst carpenter, and the junk collector offered him nothing, so he still had his wooden table that worked perfectly well. And I have to tell you one thing about other with that story. That junk collector had a son, and his son's name was Walter. I'm going to come back to Walter, but first we have to move on to chairs. So, as you know, there are many, many, many different kinds of chairs in the world, made by different people for different reasons. And so when we were building and starting our inn, of course we could have bought chairs. But given that we were in this tension, and this tension is so important in our project, and so important, we think, in finding our way forward between the old and the new, a chair like any of these beautiful chairs would have held, wouldn't have, not have been able to hold the meaning and wouldn't have been able to do the job that we wanted to do. And so we realized we had to do it ourselves. And you remember I said we wanted to be art-centric. So at this point, we realized Wait a minute, one of the big differences between people who have and those who don't, those who have have access to great design. So we expanded our program to include designers as well as artists. And the first designer, so-called, because he's an architect, was Todd Saunders, who came to the island to work with us. And he's a Newfoundlander who, like many of us, went away from home and his practices in Norway. And his challenge was to design the studios that would be used by the artists that we hoped would come and spend time with us on the island. And he had that same challenge, to create structures that were made of us, made of the place, but yet had a resonance in the future. And to, these structures had to live in that tension. And so these are all made of wood. They're scattered around the island in different places. They're all off the grid. 
And I think he's done a, a masterful job of capturing us and, give, and helping us with that path forward. There's the, the other wild things. There's a, several herds of caribou on the island. And I should clarify, this is not an artist colony. They live in the community, tangled up with the rest of us, but they work in these studios. There they are, tangled up in community. And so when they arrive, of course, one of the draws to the island is people are thirsty, these people in particular are thirsty for the power of the specific. And so the immersion in place is really, really important to them to get their sea legs and to kind of get reacquainted with themselves. And so we take it upon ourselves to give them an orientation to the place. And to do that, of course, you have to go backwards. And we go backwards. And we show them and tell them as best we can the story of the Europeans discovered Newfoundland in 1497. And when they got there, there were so many codfish you could walk on the water. And for 150 years, Ships came from all the European nations to fish off the coast of Newfoundland, and they would come in the spring and go home in the fall. And then they decided around 1600 to stay. And you imagine these brave people who thought, I'm not going back there. I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to try and make a go of it. And so that struggle to make a go of it in this place, in addition to the knowledge they brought with them, which wasn't enough, they had to develop a way of knowing that was born of the place. And they did. And that struggle gave rise to a deep sense of belonging. And Newfoundlanders are known for this deep, deep attachment to the natural and to their place. In fact, there's a joke of many about Newfoundlanders that is, how can you tell the Newfoundlander in heaven? He's the one moaning and groaning because he wants to go home. And so for 400 years, we fished this way, very traditional ways, small boats we made ourselves, with nets and gear we made ourselves, always within sight of the land, see the codfish on our stamp and on our money, until this thing. And many of these things came to our shores. It took exactly 30 years to bring the cod to the brink of extinction. It was so bad in the 60s, the government had to have an official resettlement act. And these kind of scenes of people taking their houses and moving on were common. But Fogo Islanders hung on because we really felt the attachment to Fogo Island and not to the other island. And so now it's not as dramatic as this. But you can see we're, in, we're just on the outside of Notre Dame Bay. We are still experiencing an absolute free fall in population. Last census in 2011 was about another 12% decline. So it's a part of the disintegration of rural places that's happening everywhere. It's not all hopeless, though. First of all, it's still a wild place. And as long as there's wilderness, there's hope. There's signs the codfish are coming back. This young man is one of the architects. He's been on the island for three years. So we have others that are creating with us now. And of course, now with all this knowledge, let's come back to the designers and their jobs, say, with the chair. We don't give them a design spec when they start. We give them this poem. And we think this does a better job than the design spec could ever do. Now, back to Walter. Walter became a musician, and he collected outport furniture, not a surprise. But the nice surprise is he decided, as in his own words, to try and repay the sins of his father. So he's published several books about traditional outport furniture. And he comes to the island very frequently and works with the designers, many who are from here, two Dutch people actually, and tries to help them understand the spirit and the soul which, which the traditional pieces were made. There they are at work, hopefully thinking about chairs. And there's a lot you can say about a chair. This is a very famous piece of art from someone who looked at a chair as an image, as an object, and as a concept. And of course, the designers were all looking at it in their own different ways. One of our boat builders on the island, and he's got his own way of doing things. This is the young designer who's from Montreal who developed a chair you've been seeing all along. And sometimes, you know, a chair can tell us stuff that words just can't. And there are many different chairs and different designers. And when you think about it, we can actually expect a lot from a chair. And when I look at this particular chair, I realize both my parents would have been pleased. My mother would have been delighted with the newness of it and the fact that it allowed her to kind of escape the suffocating present. And my father would have taken great comfort 
from the fact that it has the place in it and it has our story in it. And so, as it is with the chair, so it is within. There's a lot to say about all, all of this, but that's the spirit with which we've done everything. We've tried to look inside our traditional interiors and find new expressions and interpretations, whether it's quilts or wallpaper. And so here we are at the inn. Now, this inn belongs to the Fogo Island people. It's a social entrepreneurship, which means that every cent that's made at this inn belongs to the Fogo Island people. And it has to serve them in other ways. It's a community asset, it's a cultural asset, and a social asset. It has to carry the meaning that we give it, and it has to tell our story. It also has to work for the guests that will come. It has to fill their needs, and it has to hold value for them. And so we come back to that price tag on the chair. It's been there from the beginning. How would you assign a value to this chair? And should its value, do you think, be measured by the ends that it serves? And will its price ultimately be a good reflection of that value? And those questions are really another way of asking what really matters. And of course, everybody has to answer that for themselves. But I maintain that this isn't just a chair. And so, I have lots of time. I could sing you many songs, but, but and not because I'm a singer, but because I'm a Fogo Islander, and it's what Fogo Islanders do. I want to leave you with a song, preferably an unmediated song. Maybe the mic can go away. How still lies the bay in the light western air that blows from the crimson horizon. Once more we tack home with a dry empty hole, saving gas in the breezes so fair. She's a lovely Cape Islander old, but still sound, but so lost in the long liner's shadow. Make and break and make do, but the fish are so few. She won't be replaced should she founder. Now it's hard not to think of before the big war. When the cod were so cheap and so plenty, foreign trawlers go by now with long seen eyes, taking all when we seldom take any. And the young folk don't stay with the fishermen's way. Long ago, they all moved to the city. And the ones left behind, old and tired and blind, won't work for a pound or a penny. I can see the big draggers have stirred up the bay, leaving lobster pots smashed on the bottom. Can they think it don't pay to respect the old ways? that make and break men have not forgotten. For we still keep our time to the turn of the tide. And this boat that I built with my father still lifts to the sky. This one longer and I still talk like old friends on the water. In Make and Break Harbor, the boats are so few. Too many are pulled up and rotten. Most houses stand empty, old nets hung to dry, are blown away, lost and forgotten. Thank you.
Peter. Great story. Theepauze tot de circusmuziek. Can't you see I love you? Please don't break my heart. 